and welcome to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. I am your host, Sandy Lowry's, and the Good Girl Confessional Podcast is proudly brought to us by the award-winning platform WB40, Women Beyond 40, a platform for women 40, 50, 60, and beyond, who have no more Fs to give and want to talk about the important stuff. You can check us out at WB40.com. Before I begin today's podcast, I would like to recognise the traditional owners on of the land on which this podcast is recorded and where I live and play. And in my case, it's the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nations. And I pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present, and those emerging. I would also like to pay homage to their ancient history as storytellers. Today in the podcast, I'm fangirling a little bit about my next guest, and she's pretty incredible. She is synonymous with producing in television in Australia, and and deservedly so, because there's probably nothing that she hasn't done in this realm. I am talking about the, the incredible and amazing Anita Jacobi, who has um, gone beyond her extraordinary career producing shows such as 60 Minutes, Morning Television, Enough Rope with Andrew Denton, the list goes on and on, um, to write a, a book basically about things that she found out about a parent. This is an incredible book called Secrets Beyond the Screen. Um, It's really um, a book about things she discovered about her dad after he passed away. It's a powerful book, but Anita Jacobi um, really is a legend in this country in television and in print media. I certainly am fangirling. I cannot wait for you to hear her story and her extraordinary wisdom. Please welcome to the confessional, Anita Jacobi. Hey there. When Sandy's not interviewing kick-ass women, she's hanging out with me at Alex the Seal, a podcast about music and nostalgia. I'm Joe Pibus, and each episode, Sandy and I talk about all the songs that got us hooked up, knocked up, and broken up. Do yourself a favour and search Alex the Seal on your podcast app. Love you, Molly. Hi, Anita, and welcome to the Good Girl Confessional. How are you today? Oh, Sandy, I'm great. What's not to like? I'm sitting opposite you <laughs> and about to have a great chat. Oh, you are fabulous. I, oh, uh, I, I will... want to say thank you for having me. That's what I really should have said, <laughs> so I appreciate it. Uh, look, thank you so much for joining me today because I'm absolutely thrilled. I am a huge fan of everything that you do and you know have done, continue to do. Um, you're really extraordinary, and um, there's so much today that I want to talk to you about because <laughs> well, firstly, uh, you've thank had... you, thank you. I just feel <laughs> a little bit um, blown away, but thank you very much for what you, your comments. Oh, you've had this extraordinary career, I have to say, and it's pretty enviable and uh, have won a lot of um, awards and accolades for the work that you have done. And, you you know, for obvious reasons, it's quite extraordinary. I I guess, like, I really want to talk to you today about um, your amazing book, which is called Secrets Beyond the Screen. But I guess before we get to that, I would really love everyone to hear a little bit more about your um, stellar career in um, both print and television media. It's quite extraordinary. Um, So let's start out, I guess, how it all started for you, because interestingly, You studied economics at university and somehow end up in television. So how did that all happen? That did. Uh, Look, I was never a terribly good student (laughs) from day one. I mean, I I actually, even when I was in um, high school, I got into an enormous amount of trouble and got thrown out of a private girls' school here in Sydney, which was not something that I'm particularly proud of now. And, in fact, I've never been invited back really to uh, that school back as it is. So um, I did, I, as you said, I, I did leave school and I went on to, I actually wanted to do economics law, but I really didn't apply myself enough to do law. Law is very similar to journalism when you think about it. A lot of journalists, you know, go into law before they become journalists. Um, but I always wanted to be a journalist. And uh, so I got an opportunity initially um, when I was at university to actually go and work for a publishing company called Paul Hamlin's. And I started out very much at a time and very young as a marketing trainee. But because my English was 
reasonably good. I got moved into editorial at quite a young age and began to learn what editing was about and working in publishing. And I I was easily the youngest person there, but I learned with some really creative and outlandish people who actually (laughs) meant that when I finally got into television, I could handle anything because I'd started with some really interesting people at such a young age. So that's how I got started um, and uh, moved on from there. Wow, um, incredible. Um, it's, it, nowadays, I suppose it's a much harder kind of thing, I guess, to get into television, um, television production. But um, for you, how did television come about? Like you worked on some pretty big television programs, really, so early 80s. Yes. And um, how, did, you know, how did you feel about getting into television? Look, I loved it. I came out of, I actually, after publishing, landed a job um, when Ita Buttrose was the editor of the Women's Weekly and it was all women. That's about the only time in my career I've had a female, or one of the few times I've had a female boss. Um, And I worked with Ita at the Women's Weekly and then an opportunity came up at Simon Townsend's Wonderworld, which was a kid's show, but it was really more directed at adults. I don't know if you recall it. It was Monday to Friday. It was in the afternoons. It was like a a kind of kid's current affairs show. And that was the most extraordinary experience on many levels, mainly because there were only two of us researching and writing up to 11 uh, reports a week, finding all those stories, coming up with music locations, the talent to tell those stories. It's what I would traditionally call a sweatshop. So I really learned um, quite early on about television and, and, and threw myself into that. But then what I decided was I really wanted to go into news. So I kept knocking on doors to try and get a job as a reporter and tell news because that's a great passion of mine, news and current affairs. And I managed to get an opportunity at one of those um, regional areas, which was Newcastle. And that was a great training ground for television and for just being thrown into chief of staff roles in a newsroom, going out and reporting on stories, everything from fires to fatal accidents to, you know, the, the breakdown of the BHP in Newcastle. And at a young age, you really started learning the nuts and bolts of storytelling and television making. And that was a great training ground for me. And I recommend it for anybody listening to this if they're interested in getting into television that rural areas is often a great way to start. Oh, that's brilliant advice, actually. Um, yeah, interesting. I will say that I do very much remember Simon Townsend's Wonderworld um, when I was in high school and I remember um, coming home. It was always on in the afternoon when you got mm. home from school, right? Um, yeah. Quite amazing. And I will, I guess I, I'm interested to know what that dynamic was like because Simon Townsend was so huge at the time. Um, What was he like to work with? So um, you're right. It was a huge program. It probably gets lost in the distance of time. The program won five Logies and numerous other awards, and it was so popular, and it was the training ground for people like Amanda Keller, uh, who, of course, we all know, um, Angela Conterns, who was in radio, Jonathan Coleman, who was on 10, all these really, really talented people at a very young age. Um, Simon Simon is and was an interesting character to work with. He was, I guess he was very creative. He actually created this show and I, I, I applaud him for doing that. But often uh, in organisations, the culture can be the wrong kind of culture. And I found it very much like a sweatshop. I don't think we as young people were treated as well as we should have been. Uh, and that taught me a lot about how you manage people and how you create a culture that is acceptable for people, not just young people, for any people to work in. Um, So probably in reflection, there was stuff that I think should have been done differently at that time. But as you rightly said, it was the early 1980s. And I think um, those kind of issues with the way that you treated staff and cultures were really not on your agenda. It was actually just making programs and kicking goals and winning. That's really what it was all about. And that was the culture that I grew up in. Yeah, well, um, it's a good, you know, as, as tough as that must have been, and I'm sure it was, I feel like in a way, did it kind of set you on a path for understanding how much hard work would be ahead of you and and cutting your teeth, I guess, in really difficult circumstances? Yes, I think it did because I uh, 
I was able, I had to perform 24 seven. You were constantly coming up with ideas, you know, because there were only two researchers and writers on that show. And as I said earlier, we were doing 11 stories a week each. And that's an enormous amount. I mean, you know, you're generating five half hours of, sh of content per week and it was relentless. And the burnout on doing that was really high. I lasted a year which was probably more than most researchers and writers lasted. But what it did was it honed my thinking and it honed me the way that I thought about ideas and that everybody has ideas and that you need to look more broadly and actually sort of think laterally about how you can make an idea. And I moved from Simon Townsend's Wonderworld into news. But then what I did was, um, along with a, a very um, influential woman who I, I'd worked with, Helen Graswell, we created a show for Channel 7 and we actually sold it to Channel 7. I think I was 23 or 24. Um, but at those days, I didn't really know what I was doing. But what I knew was I could actually, again, come up with ideas, find the people to tell those ideas and actually create content and create a show. And we did create this show that was on the Seven Network. It went up against two of the biggest shows in the world. Um, well, in the world. One was MASH, which was the biggest show of the world. And the other one was the biggest show in Australia, which was Sale of the Century on the Nine Network. So again, we were learning on the road and we were just kind of applying the skills that we'd learned back at Simon Townsend's Wonderwall that I'd learnt on the road as a news reporter and creating something that was really quite something. So um, I still look back at that and think, I don't know how we did it, but we did. <laughs> and I learned a lot in those days about making television from a very young age. Yeah, wow. I'm kind of fascinated as well because you, um, like 23, I can't even, can't even begin to fathom how that was. You know, some of the most magical things in life, I, I think, happen when we're not thinking about it. Like if, if you knew what laid ahead, maybe you wouldn't have made some of the choices that you made because then you get nervous and then you start yes. to doubt yourself, right? Yeah. So at 23, yes. how magical that you pulled that off. But, but, but I would say to you, Sandy, I happen to have a, and I know we'll talk about the book later, but I happen to have a parent, a father, who really from a very young age empowered me and made me believe that I was confident and capable of doing anything and that I had the courage to do that. And I think when a parent is so empowering at such a young age, that actually shapes the way you are for the rest of your life. I mean, sure, it doesn't mean that I haven't had some incredible hurdles and I've dealt, you know, and I've, and I've actually sort of come up against walls that are almost insurmountable, but I've always felt like I was had the capacity to do what I was doing. And so to sell a show at 23 to the managing director of the Seven Network and get that up and, and running, I mean, that was also I did it with Helen. I didn't do it alone. I had somebody who was very, you know, we worked together. So we were a really strong powerful duo and felt very confident in what we were doing and we felt empowered what that to me was a gift that my father gave me yeah wow um I think you're right you know and, we, and as you rightly say we will get to this shortly um because you write so beautifully about <laughs> your dad um in in the book that you have written and he he does sound like he was an incredible force um, behind everything that you have done, really, you know. Yes. And um, I think you're I right. Really I think having that. that sort of strong connection because, you know, I suppose your parents lived through a time as well where, you know, your mum was a homemaker and worried a bit about what was going to happen, whereas your dad was like, no, you can do it and off you go. That's right. And, and I think the one thing I would say to any of your listeners today is if they have children, and most of them probably do, I would have these conversations to actually empower them so they feel really confident in who and what they are because they bounce off their parents. Their key role models are going to be their parental figures or their grandparents or some close relative. So in the way that you raise a child and an adult is just so important to their sense of self-worth and their sense of who they are. So I, I know we'll again come back to that later, but I just, I really can't stress that enough. 
Oh, that is some beautiful advice there. I have um, raised Hello, Sandy here from the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is proudly brought to us by WB40, a platform for women 40, 50, 60 and beyond. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like to see the rest of the video, please head over to WB40.com and subscribe to WB40 Extra. By subscribing to WB40, WB40 Extra, you're helping to support the hard-won wisdom of incredible women. So thank you. Please remember to like, share and follow.